last lesson here on the fundamentals of right division. A lot of what's going to be on the exam is going to come out of this uh, section right here. Um, last week, we looked at rightly dividing the Gospels. We looked at the, the Gospel of the Kingdom, Paul's Gospel, the Gospel of the Grace of God, and those many Gospels. Um, this morning, or this evening for you guys, we're going to we're going to try to get through as many of these things as we possibly can. So I can't <clears throat> go into great detail on these things, but uh, these are things that that you can go and study for yourself. And uh, I'm going to give you the fundamentals of it, um, but you have to really get your Bibles and study them for yourself. And the the first thing we're going to look at this morning is is rightly dividing. Peter and Paul, the, the ministry of Peter and Paul. Uh, when you come to the book of Acts, um, the, the book of Acts transitions. The, the, it starts with Peter preaching to Israel and ends with Paul preaching to the Gentiles. And so one of the most important things that we've got to get rightly divided is the difference between those two ministries. In Galatians chapter 2, <clears throat> Paul is sent to Jerusalem, and uh, he communicates. Um, he shares with the apostles in Jerusalem the gospel that he preached to the, to the uh, Gentiles. As he says there in Galatians chapter 2, that he, he said, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel. Uh, which I preach among the Gentiles. <clears throat> and he says in chapter two that, that he says, but contrary wise in verse seven, he says, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. And then he says, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And so right here, we, we see that there is a difference between the gospel committed to Paul and the gospel committed to Peter, and that they, they had separate apostleships. And, and Peter, we're going to start here with Peter. Peter was an apostle of the circumcision, meaning Peter's ministry was to the circumcised people only. Uh, and his gospel was called the gospel of the circumcision, meaning it was a gospel that was specific and was to be preached to the people of circumcision, Israel. Now, in order to really understand what this gospel of the circumcision is, you have to go back to the first time circumcision is mentioned. And it's in Genesis chapter 17. And here in that chapter, God tells Abraham, he says, I will make thee exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And so here we see that, that it deals, first off, it deals with the multiplying and the fruitfulness of Abraham and how God is going to make nations of Abraham and, and kings are going to come out of him. Then he says, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee. Now notice this, in their generations. Uh, talking about the generations of Abraham's seed. It's talking about Abraham's family. And, and God, God is telling Abraham here that in the generations of his seed, as his, as his family is multiplied and as his family grows, that eventually God is going to establish a covenant with them for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so right here we see in Genesis 17 that this deals with an everlasting covenant that God is going to make with the family of Abraham and how he's going to give them a piece of land for an everlasting possession. And now in verse nine, he says, and God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant. Therefore, thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. 
This is my covenant, which he shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And so right here, we see that circumcision was a token, a meaning a sign or evidence of a covenant between Abraham and God. And this, this sign of circumcision deals, if you go back, if you remember what we're talking about here, circumcision was a sign of a covenant between God and Abraham's family, dealing with God, making an everlasting covenant with them and giving them everlasting possession of a land. So that's what circumcision deals with. Um, it deals with a specific family of people and specific promises that God had made that people. And so when Peter's preaching the gospel of the circumcision, his gospel concerned the, the confirming and fulfillment of these specific promises that had been made to the nation of Israel. And so in Romans 9, 4 through 5, Paul talking about Israel here, he says that the that his brethren are Israelites. And now he says seven things. He talks about seven things that pertain to the Israelites. He says, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. And so these seven specific things pertain to the Israelites. They had specific things that were that were given to them and promised to them as a nation of people. If you look there at the end, he, he says, and the promises whose are the fathers. And so God made specific promises to the fathers of the Israelites. And, and there's a gospel called the gospel of the circumcision that pertains to these specific promises made to the nation of Israel. Now, us as Gentiles, in Ephesians 2, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 11, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. Now notice this, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And so the, the uncircumcision was a was aliens. These things that pertain to the Israelites, you and I as the uncircumcision and, and Gentiles, we were aliens from these things and strangers from these covenants. We had no part in them. They only pertain to the circumcision. And so, and so circumcision, uh, when, when Paul talks about the circumcision and the gospel of the circumcision, the, the, the circumcision concerns the Israelites who have been called and set apart by God and the gospel of the circumcision concerns God's word to that people. It is a specific message and a specific doctrine, uh, concerning the promises made to the nation of Israel. And so you've got to understand that as it pertains to the gospel of the circumcision. Now, Paul said in Romans 15 and 8, uh, he says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. When, when Christ came to the earth, his ministry uh, on the earth was to the circumcision only. Uh, if you look at Matthew chapter 15, come to Matthew chapter 15 in your Bible. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 21. It says, then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Zidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. 
Christ ignores this woman. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now notice Christ, Christ emphatically in his own words said that he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, Christ in his earthly ministry was not sent to the Gentiles. In his earthly ministry, he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was a minister of the circumcision. And so we have to understand this stuff, guys. So, so many Gentiles today go to the four gospels and they try to they try to get their doctrine and their gospel from these things that pertain to Israel and Israel only. Um, the gospel of the uncircumcision, which is to you was committed to Paul. Christ was a minister of Israel. He was a minister of the circumcision. Peter was an apostle of the circumcision. He was he was given he he was given the gospel of the circumcision. That is a message that pertains uh, to the Israelites concerning the promises that were made to their fathers. So so God made these promises to the Israelites. Christ came to confirm those promises, and then Peter was given the gospel to preach uh, to the circumcision concerning uh, the confirmation of these promises. And so Peter was an apostle to the circumcision, and he had a gospel specific to those people, and it concerns the confirmation of the promises to Israel by Jesus Christ. And so Peter when Peter preaches Christ, Peter and Paul both preached the Lord Jesus Christ, but Peter preached Jesus Christ according to prophecy. Paul preached Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And so, and one pertained to the circumcision, another to the uncircumcision. Now in Romans 15, 16, I remember Jesus Christ, minister of the circumcision, now look at what Paul says in Romans 15, 16. He says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Uh, that is ordained of God. You can't change it. You can be, you can be ignorant of it. You can teach it wrong. Doesn't, but this is ordained of God. This is how you, if you want to be in line with God, and if you want to be biblical, you have to look at what God has ordained. And what God ordained is that the Apostle Paul is the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. So what did he minister to the Gentiles? The gospel of God. Why? That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. There is only one way that the offering up of Gentiles is acceptable in the sight of God. And it's not through them becoming circumcised. That is not through them becoming Israel. What, what makes the, the Gentiles acceptable unto God is this ministry that was given to Paul to, to be the minister of Jesus Christ to us, to minister God's gospel to us, that our offering up might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. And so it is Paul's ministry uh, that makes the Gentiles acceptable unto God today. And so we, we, we've got to get that. Uh, the, the gospel of the circumcision was for Israel. And Paul was given the gospel of the uncircumcision for us Gentiles. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul tells you there. Um, let me get over here and read you a couple of verses. I only got Ephesians 3, 8 up. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says in verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. And so Paul, Paul received a dispensation of God's grace for us. And he tells you what it is in verse three, how that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery, 
which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now in verse 8, look at what he says, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so when we talk about the gospel of the circumcision, it, it concerns the promises that were made to the nation of Israel concerning their covenants, their, their inheritance of the nation, their inheritance of the land of Israel, as an everlasting possession. But when we talk about the gospel of the uncircumcision, so, so when Peter preached Christ, he preached him according to prophecy. Paul was preaching Christ here according to the revelation of the mystery. And part of that mystery is that Christ, Christ has inherited riches uh, that were unsearchable. Uh, meaning you can't find them prior to them being revealed to Paul. And the beauty of, 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 of Paul's gospel and the gospel of the uncircumcision is that this and these unsearchable riches of Christ, God elected before the foundation of the world. He elected Jew and Gentile to receive these unsearchable riches of Christ. And so the when you you and I as Gentiles, as it pertained to the promises of Israel, you and I were strangers to those things. We had no part in those things that pertain to the circumcision. But now God has revealed through the ministry of Paul <clears throat> that there's this inheritance and these riches of Christ in the heavenly places that he actually elected both Jews and Gentiles to inherit through faith in the gospel. And so just understanding those differences there. In fact, I got it up here. The main differences here. <clears throat> so when it comes to the circumcision and the uncircumcision, <clears throat> the circumcision pertains to the circumcised people only, the Israelites. Uh, God made promises to that specific people. The gospel of the circumcision that was committed to Peter <clears throat> concerns the confirmation of those promises. It deals with Israel's land, their, their new covenant, uh, and all those things. And so this gospel of the circumcision pertains to the Israelites. It deals with the earth, and it deals with the scriptures of the prophets. And so it concerns Israel's inheritance and their promises in the earth. The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to Paul. And it is to Jews and Gentiles alike. It is not just to the Israelites. And it concerns a heavenly inheritance. And it, it, it is based upon the revelation of the mystery. And so understanding those, those two ministries of Peter and Paul is very important, guys. And you need to, you need to I've, I've laid a foundation here. That is not all the details of this. But you need to go take these verses and go and study these things and, and make sure that you understand them for yourself. Now, the next subject we're going to move into is the, the baptisms of the Bible, rightly dividing baptisms. Baptism is one of the most uh, controversial subjects in Christianity. If you know anything about church history, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has put multitudes of Christians to death over this issue. Uh, people fight over this issue all the time about baptism. Um, and what you'll find out is that the vast majority of, of people don't even know what baptism is. Now, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, the writer of Hebrews mentions the doctrine of baptisms. Notice that it's plural. There's baptisms, more than one. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 5, that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so automatically, right off the bat, you see 
that we've got to study our Bible to make sure we know what we're talking about because Hebrews mentions multiple baptisms. Paul says there's one baptism. And so we're going to get into why Paul says there's one baptism. He doesn't, he's not saying that there's only one baptism in the Bible. Uh, Paul was speaking of a specific baptism for this dispensation. Uh, but there's more than one baptism in the Bible. And so in Hebrews 6, 2, those doctrine, the doctrine of baptisms, what does he mean by that? Well, look over in Hebrews chapter 9. Get your Bible and look at Hebrews chapter 9. Now, what he's talking about, Hebrews chapter 9, is he's talking about Israel's old covenant. He's talking about the Old Testament. If you look in Hebrews 9, 1, he says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. And so what, what the writer of Hebrews is discussing here is Israel's first covenant, their earthly tabernacle, and their priesthood. And all those things that God ordained for them to do in divine service to him. But in Hebrews 9, 8 or Hebrews 9, 7, it says, Into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So what he's talking about here is the holy of holies. When that first tabernacle was set up under the first covenant, only the high priest could enter in to the Holy of Holies, and he can only go in once a year. Now, he says in verse 8, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while was the first tabernacle was yet standing. So under the first covenant, while the first tabernacle was yet standing, the way to God was not made manifest. Only the high priest could go into God's presence once a year. Nobody else could. And so that that was a that was a that was the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, signifying to Israel that you cannot come unto God through this covenant. It signified that the way to God was not yet made manifest. Now in verse nine, the verse I got up here on the screen. He says, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So the whole that whole first covenant never made anybody perfect. Thou, he said, which stood only in meats and drinks. And now notice this and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now that, that phrase there, diverse washings. Now that, that word washings there in Greek is the same word baptisms back here in Hebrews 6 too. And so what, what is baptisms? They're diverse washings under the law. The doctrine of baptisms is in Israel's old covenant. And when he tells them to <clears throat> leave these doctrine of baptisms, he's telling them to leave the, 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 the diverse washings that they were taught under the first covenant. And so that's the first thing you need to understand is that baptism comes from the Old Testament. Um, it's not just a New Testament. Now, the word baptism is not in the Old Testament, but 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 it's it's referring to the diverse washings that they were required to do under the law. If you go back to the book of Leviticus and you look at all the times that they're told to wash something, they were to wash sacrifices in water, they were to wash vessels, they were to wash their clothes in water, the priests were to wash in the in the brazen laver, they were to wash their bodies with water. If they touch something unclean, they had the wash in water. If, if blood got on their clothes, they had the wash. These are baptisms, diverse washings. And what baptism signifies, 
uh, what baptism represents is it represents something that is being sanctified and cleansed for the purpose of God's service. And that's what baptism represents in the Bible. Is it something being set apart and sanctified by God, cleansed and made holy for his service? So when Paul says that we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into Christ to be freed from sin, that we might become the servants of righteousness so that we could live unto God. And so just understand that that's what baptism is, is it's, it signifies something being set apart for God's service. Now, in the Old Testament, those diverse washings in water were carnal ordinances. Uh, physical water cannot cleanse something for God. This is why the, this is why those baptisms, just like he says right here, that it could not make him that did the service perfect. This is why no matter how much they washed in water, they could not they could not enter into God's presence. Uh, now he tells them, look over in Hebrews chapter ten. Hebrews chapter ten, verse number nineteen. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, the pure water that they are to wash in today is the, the water of the word of God. But what he's telling them there is, is that they now, under the first covenant, they could not enter in to the presence of God. He says, but now through this new and living way, they now have, a, they now have entrance. They can now enter into the presence of God. They can now go into the holy of holies. But he tells them how to draw near. They are to have their hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and their bodies washed with pure water. And so those washings of water in the Old Testament signified or represented a, uh, uh, something better. Those were just, all those things back there were shadows. And so just understand that that's where baptism comes from. And when the writer of Hebrews talks about the doctrine of baptisms, he's talking about all these different uh, washings in water that took place under the first covenant. Now we're going to look at some different baptisms in the Bible here. We just looked at one or, or some in Hebrews 6 to the doctrines of baptisms. Uh, and that deals with the diverse washings under the law. Uh, you can read about those in Leviticus guys. I challenge you to go back to Leviticus and every time they're told to wash something in water or to cleanse something in water, that is a doctrine of baptism. Uh, now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we read of a baptism. Um, and in fact, it's, it's not even, uh, <laughs> uh, there ain't a single person that got wet in this baptism. First uh, Corinthians chapter 10. I don't have the verses up here. Guy. I got the verses, but I didn't write them up here. So if you want to flip to first Corinthians chapter 10 and read it with me, you can. First uh, Corinthians 10 1 Paul says, moreover, brethren. I would not that ye should be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so notice this was a baptism in the cloud and in the sea. Not a single, not a single Jew got wet. Not a single person that was that was baptized in the cloud and in the sea got wet. Now they are submersed, they are emerged, they are completely covered by the cloud of God's glory. And they've got water on all sides, but they didn't get wet. But that is a baptism unto Moses. And so that is Israel. That baptism there deals with Israel being freed from Pharaoh 
and being baptized unto Moses so that they can serve God. And so that is a that is a bab, that's that's a baptism. Uh, that's not a baptism that we are performing today, but that is a baptism. And so you should all already see <clears throat> that there's more than one baptism in the Bible. And so it's going to be it's going to be important when we get to where Paul says there's one baptism. We know he's not saying there's only one baptism in the Bible. He's saying there's only one baptism today. There's only one baptism being performed today. That's what he's talking about. Uh, and so that baptism there in first Corinthians chapter 10 deals with Israel's baptism unto Moses in Matthew chapter three. Look at Matthew chapter three. Cause there's three baptisms in this verse. Matthew chapter three, verse 11. This is John the Baptist here. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire and so notice there's three baptisms in that verse there's a water baptism there's a holy ghost baptism and a fire baptism and so the biggest mistake that people make is when they hear the word baptism, they automatically think of water. And the reason that people automatically think of water when they think of baptism is because religion has taught them to think like that. The Bible didn't teach you to think like that. John just told you, I baptize you with water, but there's another one coming who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so if you can be baptized with water, the Holy Ghost and with fire, is it not a great mistake and error to always assume water when you read the word baptism in the Bible? It's a great error. But church has taught us to think like that. Uh, when Paul gets over there and talks about the baptism for the dead, what people assume is that somebody's being baptized in water for dead people because they assume water when they hear baptism you can't do that guys <clears throat> and so what i want you to what i want to point out here though matthew 3 11 is john's baptism john's baptism is with water unto repentance now israel's baptism in first corinthians was unto moses John's baptizing them with water unto repentance. And so what does that mean? It means that John's baptism was to set apart a repentant people for the first coming of Jesus Christ. He's getting Israel ready for the coming of their Messiah. And so his baptism was unto repentance. Christ is coming to baptize the nation of Israel with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We're going to get to those baptisms in a moment, but John's baptism came first and what his baptism was for, it, 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 it set apart and identified the people in Israel that were repentant for the coming of Christ. Look in John chapter one. Uh, John the Baptist tells you exactly why he baptized. We don't have to guess. We don't have to go to some uh preacher or anything else john the baptist tells you why he baptized uh john 1 31 <clears throat> john the baptist says here and i knew him not but that he should be made manifest to israel therefore am i come baptizing with water why did john come to baptizing with water so that Jesus Christ could be manifest to the nation of Israel. John's baptism was for no other purpose than to manifest the Lord Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel. And so <clears throat> that baptism was for a specific time, guys. It had, it had to do with the nation of Israel. John's baptism was for the nation of Israel. He is baptizing them with water unto repentance 
to get them ready for the coming of their Messiah and to manifest their Messiah to them. And so that's that's another baptism. So right now we, we're, we've already seen that there were multiple baptisms in the Old Testament. There was a baptism of Israel unto Moses, John's baptism unto repentance. Now in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, you have another baptism here. Now, remember one of the differences between Peter and Paul is that when Peter is sent by the Lord, he's sent to baptize. Uh, Matthew 28, he is specifically told to baptize. Uh, Paul said he was not sent to baptize. Now in Acts 2.38, uh, look at verse 37, Acts 2.37. Now when they heard this, who's uh, now we got to identify who's they when they heard this? Who is it? Well, if you go back to verse 22, you see who Peter's talking to. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. So who's Peter preaching to? Israel. And it says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, what Peter's talking about here, guys, is he began he began this message with the prophets with a prophecy from the book of Joel. And if you go back and you read the book of Joel, you're going to learn that it's about the day of the Lord. It's about Israel's last days. And that God tells them in Joel chapter two, that if they will repent and turn to him, that he will pity them and have mercy upon them. And afterward, he will pour out his spirit upon them. That's what Peter is talking about. But everything in the prophecy of Joel was conditioned upon Israel's repentance. Go back and read those three chapters of Joel and you're going to see it for yourself. Peter is preaching to Israel concerning their prophetic scriptures. And so when they ask, what must we do or what shall we do? Peter tells them to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now notice this for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because the promise is unto you. He's talking about the promise of God pouring out his spirit upon Israel in Joel chapter two, if they will repent. And so, and so Peter, Peter, listen guys, that is not, that is not the message to the Gentiles today. This message was to the nation of Israel. Peter is a minister of the circumcision. He is preaching the gospel of the circumcision. When they say, what shall we do? That is Israel talking. And so that baptism there is, I mean, this is, this is where the church of Christ gets their doctrine. They preach baptismal regeneration right out of Acts 2.38. That baptism is, is for the nation of Israel. They are to repent and be baptized in order to receive this promise that was given to them in the book of Joel has nothing to do with, with our dispensation today. Um, I hope you under, I hope you guys understand this stuff, man, because it's very important. If, if you're going to be a, if you're going to be a man that's approved of God, you're going to have to be able to deal with these things yourself, understand these things yourself so that you can go out here and, and instruct people and bring them out of these uh, religious systems that keep people in bondage with false doctrine and keep them in bondage to these things. And so that's a baptism. Uh, Peter and them were clearly sent to baptize. Uh, back in Matthew chapter three, now we have the two baptisms of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 
the Lord Jesus Christ never baptized any individual in water. He never baptized a single man in water. Now, his disciples did, but he never did. Now, uh, Matthew 3, 11, Christ has two baptisms there, one with the Holy Ghost and one with fire. Now, people think that the fire baptism is, a, is something that they want, and you don't. You don't want the baptism of fire. Nobody does. Um, if you look in Matthew 3, 10, you're going to see what the fire is. John the Baptist says, uh, Matthew 3, 10, Now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The baptism of fire is a baptism of wrath and judgment upon the unrepentant. And so John is baptizing Israel unto repentance. When Christ comes, he's going to baptize the repentant with the Holy Ghost and gather them into his garner, meaning his kingdom. Those fruitful people are going to be gathered into his kingdom, but the unrepentant and the unfruitful are going to be, are going to be baptized with fire. And so that's, that's Christ dealing with the nation of Israel. When he says he will thoroughly purge his floor, Christ is going to thoroughly, thoroughly purge the nation of Israel. And he's going to gather all the wheat of Israel, all the repentant of Israel into his kingdom. But all the chaff, he's going to burn up with unquenchable fire. And so Christ was coming to baptize the nation with the Holy Ghost. Those are, what, those are the repentant. They're going to enter into the kingdom and the rest are going to be baptized with fire. And so those are two baptisms. Now we come to Paul's baptism or what Paul calls the one baptism. If you look in Ephesians chapter four, now I think it's safe to say, guys, if you look at these, the baptism of first Corinthians chapter 10 is not being performed today. The, he, the, 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 the baptisms of, of Hebrews 6, 2, those diverse washings under the law, we are not doing those today. We are not doing 1 Corinthians 10 today. We are not doing Matthew 3, 11 today. John's baptism under repentance, we are not baptizing in water under repentance. That was John's baptism to manifest Christ to Israel. Acts 2.38 is not our gospel today. We are not telling anybody to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. There is no baptism with fire being performed today. So when Paul says in Ephesians 4.5, if you go to Ephesians 4.3, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And so he's talking about the unity of God's spirit. Now he's going to tell you what that unity is. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. When Paul says there's one baptism, he means there is one baptism of the spirit that unifies us in one body under one Lord with one faith, one God and father of all. You can be baptized in water a thousand times and not be a part of the body of Christ. The only way you become a, a part of the body of Christ today is 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 
for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body that is the baptism of today that is the one baptism it is by one spirit into one body and paul tells you in 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 galatians chapter 3 how you receive the spirit of god you receive the spirit of god by the hearing of faith Ephesians 1.13 says that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you hear the gospel of Christ, how that he died, was buried, and rose again from the dead, and you trust in Jesus Christ. The moment you hear that gospel, believe it, and trust in Christ, the Spirit of God baptizes you into the body of Christ and seals you there. Uh, unto the day of redemption. Uh, and so that is the, the unity Paul's talking about. The one baptism that unifies us in the spirit is by the spirit into the body. Uh, what divides people today is all these other baptisms. Uh, baptism does more, water baptism and fighting about water baptism does more to to divide the church than unify it people argue about whether you should be sprinkled or immersed what name you should be baptized in whether you have to be baptized to be saved and all these things and paul paul clearly teaches us in his epistles that there's one baptism that puts us into the lord jesus christ when he says in romans 6 as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. He's not talking about water baptism. He is talking about the baptism by the spirit into the body of Christ. When he says in Galatians, as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He's talking about being baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. That is the one baptism of our time. That is the baptism that is being performed today. It is the baptism by the Spirit of God into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So those are the baptisms. Now we're going to look at the judgments of the Bible, the, the multiple judgments in the Word of God. Um, the first judgment, if you look at Romans 4.25, Verse 24, well, verse, let's go to verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And so the notice there that Christ was delivered for our offenses. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter that uh, Christ, let me get over and read you this verse. 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so Peter says there that Christ suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. And so Christ, the first judgment I want to talk about is the judgment of sin at Calvary. And so we as sinners and our sins we were judged as sinners at the cross. Christ, as a just man, was made sin for us and suffered for those sins, bearing our sins in his own body. He bore that judgment and condemnation upon himself. And so the first judgment deals, the first judgment we're looking at here deals with the judgment of sin at Calvary. And so you as a sinner, have already been judged at the cross. And you've been condemned and put to death at the cross. And so as, as a sinner and as and our sins have already been judged. Now, there's another judgment, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let 
Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. And so even though our sins have been judged at the cross, as God's sons and God's people, God wants us to judge ourselves daily. He wants us to judge ourselves, um, um, acknowledge our sin, acknowledge our errors, acknowledge our faults. And if we don't do that, uh, then there's, there's a judgment. If we don't judge ourselves, we're going to be judged another way. And so it's important for us as God's children to judge ourselves on a daily basis so that we are not judged. Not only do we judge ourselves uh, individually, but we are to judge others within the church also. Uh, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 5 and 12, he says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Then he says, there any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. And so not only are we to, as, as God's people, are we to judge ourselves, but God has, has commanded us to judge between the brethren and to judge uh, matters in the church uh, uh, ourselves. And so we are to judge ourselves and our brethren. Uh, God has given us that judgment. If he's given us judgment of the angels and judgment of the world, then how much, how much more should we be able to judge the things that pertain to this life? And so our sins were judged once and for all at Calvary, but daily as we live in this world, God expects us to be people of judgment, to judge ourselves, to judge of the things around us and to judge people within the church. Uh, the third judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, this is when we, this, this, this judgment takes place after the rapture. Paul says in second Corinthians five ten that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And so. That judgment, the judgment seat of Christ here is for the saints. It is for saved people. Uh, the people that stand before the judgment seat of Christ are, are people that are saved. And we're going to be uh, the, the reason for that judgment. Paul states what the reason for that judgment is, is that we may receive the things done in his body. Then he says, whether according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that when that judgment day, that judgment comes, uh, every man's work is going to be made manifest. God is going to reveal the hidden counsels of the heart. He's going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness. And if any man's work abide, which he hath built, uh, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work be burned up, he shall suffer loss. And so this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ is not about our salvation. We've already, our sins have already been judged at Calvary. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ is about our reward of the inheritance. And so when, when, before we go to heaven to receive our inheritance, we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that judgment seat of Christ is going to determine the reward that we receive in the world to come. And so, it is very important, guys, to keep the judgment seat of Christ in view. 
Uh, every saved person has to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul said in Romans chapter 14 that every one of us must give an account of himself to God. Uh, and so we've all been put in the body of Christ. We've all been called by Christ. And this is why Paul says in, in Colossians that he labored, that he may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And so Paul wasn't just, he wasn't just getting people saved. Paul was getting people saved and teaching them so that he could present them perfect in Christ one day. And what he's talking about is presenting them perfect at the judgment seat of Christ. And so that's important to understand that part of the ministry is that once we get people saved, it is our responsibility to teach them uh the word of god and to build them up in wisdom and judgment and love and things of that nature so that they can be presented of value uh, paul talks about gold silver precious stones wood hay and stubble there are going to be some people that are found to be of be valuable before the judgment seat of christ and some saints that are saved they're not going to be they're going to be found like wood hay and stubble and that is good. The, your value, the value of the word of God in you, the, the, the things that God has put in your heart through his word and the ministry of faith, that's going to determine your value. And it's also going to determine the measure of the inheritance that you get. And so you could honestly say that we were judged as sinners at Calvary. We are being judged as sons daily, and we're going to be judged as servants at the judgment seat of Christ. And so, but just know that your salvation is settled at Calvary. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that if any man's work be burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. And so at the judgment seat of Christ, even if everything is burned up, it doesn't determine whether you're saved or not. You'll, it just determines your reward. And so you can suffer loss of reward, but you're going to be saved. Uh, salvation was through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the judgment seat of Christ does not deal with the issue of salvation. Salvation is already settled for us. Now, 1 Peter chapter 4, there's a judgment over here. 1 Peter 4, 17, he says, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of god now what is he talking about <laughs> well this comes from this is prophetic right here guys um if you look in jeremiah chapter 25 jeremiah chapter 25 verse number 15 <clears throat> he says, for thus saith the Lord. And guys, even, even if you're not flipping with me in the Bible, write these verses down so that you can study them for yourself. Uh, Jeremiah 25, 15, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. Now, now Jeremiah lists the nations that God that that has to drink of this wrath of God, this wine of God's wrath. Now, if you remember in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> God tells them there that they are going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. And so this is talking about the wrath of God that is coming in the last days. But in Jeremiah 25, 18, notice, the, notice where the judgment and the wrath of God begins. To wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof, to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all his people, 
Verse 20, all the mingled people and all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, Aza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom and Moab, the children of Ammon, all the kings of Tyrus and all the kings of Zidon and the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea. Now notice that this wrath of God is going to be poured out on all nations, but it begins at Jerusalem and with the cities of Judah. Now look over in Jeremiah 25, uh, verse 28. He says, And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should you be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. But notice where God begins to punish. He says, for lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. When Peter says the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, he's talking about the end times. He's talking about the last days and how God's judgment and God's wrath is going to begin in his house. And if it begin in the house of God, what shall the end be of the wicked and them that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so he's talking, the judgment of the house of God deals with the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, the cities of Israel. It deals with the tribulation period. Uh, the, the wrath and judgment of God in the, in the tribulation is going to begin with Israel, but then it's going to go to all the nations of the earth. God is going to pour out his wrath upon the whole earth, but it first begins with Israel. This is what Jeremiah, uh, you can write this verse down, Jeremiah 30 and verse number seven. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, you can read about it in Daniel 9, 27, the 70th week of Daniel. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, when Christ talks about then shall be great tribulation, uh, he tells them of Judea, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, for then shall be great tribulation. And he's talking about the judgment, the wrath that's going to be poured out, but it begins in Jerusalem. It begins at Jerusalem and then spreads to the, to the rest of the world. And so that judgment there is, a, is, a, is the nation of Israel during the tribulation. Uh, Matthew 25, another judgment here dealing with the nations of the earth. Um, now, the importance of this one, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, is if you don't, if you don't rightly divide what we're about to talk about here, a lot of people come here and they teach a works-based salvation that you go to heaven through visiting the sick and all this other stuff. <clears throat> but it's let's pay close attention to the details. Matthew 25, 31, when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he set upon the throne of his glory. That's the throne of David. He's This is talking about the second coming. When Christ comes at the second coming and he sets upon his throne in Jerusalem, verse, 20, th verse 32 says, and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And so Christ gathers all nations when he comes at the second coming. Now you and I are not going to, you and I are not going to be judged at this judgment. Our judgment was at the judgment seat of Christ after the rapture. This is a judgment that takes place at the second coming. He's going to come. He's going to set upon his throne, and then he's going to gather all the nations that are left on the earth, and he's going to gather them before him, and then he's going to separate those people, and he divides them into two categories, the sheep and the goat. The sheep, he looks at and he tells them, come blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom 
prepared from you from the foundation of the world so that the sheep go into the kingdom with Israel. The goats are told to depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But what is the basis of this judgment? How does he separate these people? Well, he says, when I was hungry, <clears throat> you gave me meat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And they say, when did we do these things unto you, O Lord? He says, when you done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so the, <clears throat> the basis of this judgment is it's based upon how the nations treat his brethren. Now, who's his brethren? His brethren is Israel. You see, when Christ comes at the second coming, Israel is coming out of a great time of trouble. They're coming out of the great tribulation. <clears throat> and the nations of the earth, the people of the earth at that time that bless Israel and, and, and take care of Israel are going to be blessed by Jesus Christ when he comes. And they're going to be, they're going to be able to enter into the kingdom because of how they treated his brethren. Those who curse his brethren are going to be cursed and kicked out of the kingdom. This goes back to one of the first promises that God made Abraham. <clears throat> the sheep nations are told, come blessed of my father. The goat nations are told, depart from me, you curse it. Remember what God told Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Uh, another place you can read about this judgment is in Joel chapter three, uh, where Christ, uh, uh, it says when he comes, he's going to, uh, gather all nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat and plead with them for his people and for his heritage, Israel. And so the basis of this judgment of the nations at the second coming, that judgment is going to be based upon their treatment of the nation of Israel during the tribulation period. And so that get that judgment right, because a lot of people come over here and they teach a works-based salvation based on this judgment. The only people being judged here are the nations that are left at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is not a judgment. That is a specific judgment for people that are alive on the earth at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's not our judgment. It's not the judgment of the, of the dead that have lived for the, the, the rest of them are going to be judged at the great white throne. And so, that is a specific judgment. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, you have the church uh, being given judgment of the angels. That's going to take place after the rapture. We are going to judge angels. God has given us, as the body of Christ, the judgment of the angelic realm. Um, Matthew 19, 28. Uh, the 12 apostles are going to set upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's going to take place there in the millennial kingdom. Uh, our judgment of the angels is also going to take place. Not only are we going to judge Satan and his angels, and they're going to be cast out of heaven, but we are going to be given judgment of the angels throughout the kingdom also. The angelic realm is going to be under the feet of the body of Christ. And then the 12 apostles are going to be given judgment over the nation of Israel. And uh, not only that, but Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ in Israel, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, is going to judge among the nations. That's during the millennial kingdom. And then the, the last judgment there is in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. It's when all the dead are raised up, all those who were. Uh, or, or you have the rapture, then you have the resurrection at the second coming, and then after the thousand years, there's going to be a great resurrection of all the dead from Adam till the, till the end of the millennial kingdom, and all those men are going to stand before God at the great white throne and be judged according to their works. Everyone not found in the book of life is going to be cast into a lake of fire. And so those are the judgments, guys. Write these scriptures down. Uh, Study these things and then 
look for the references for them. Just, just look for all the references that go along with it. That's, that's how you're going to learn how to rightly divide. Already gave Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations. One reference for that is in Joel chapter three. Um, and so, uh, ref Matthew 19, 28, uh, the apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel, a reference for that would be Isaiah chapter one, um, Isaiah chapter one, verse number 26, I will restore thy judges as at the first. Go back there and study those things and, and understand those things. All right. I'm trying to hurry up here, guys. Uh, the resurrections, you got to rightly divide resurrections in the Bible. Not everybody has the same resurrection. Um, you look, first, first Corinthians 15, 20, Paul says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits. Now get this now, first fruits of them that slept. And so the, the them there is not us, it's them. <laughs> Paul doesn't say he become the first fruits of us. He said he become the first fruits of them that slept. And so what Paul's talking about here is he's talking about all the men that died from Adam to Christ. That's why he says in the very next verse, um, for since by man came death, uh, he says, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so when Paul says here that Christ is the first fruits of them that slept, he's talking about the men, all the men that died from Adam to Christ. That when Christ rose from the dead, he become the first fruits of those that had died already. First Corinthians 15, 23, he says, but every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. So that's already happened. Afterward, they, he doesn't say we, he says they that are Christ that is coming. Paul's talking here about the resurrection of the Old Testament saints that died or the Old Testament people, all those that died from Adam to Christ. And so their resurrection, all the men that died from Adam to the Lord Jesus Christ, resurrection, when Christ rose from the dead, he become the first fruits of a resurrection that's going to happen at his coming. But you have to understand who's going to be resurrected at his coming. It is them that slept, they that are Christ. Paul would, if Paul was talking about us, he would have used the word we. He doesn't say we that are Christ. He says they that are Christ. And so got a little timeline here. Them that slept are all these men back here prior to the resurrection of Christ. They had already died in faith. Then Christ rose from the dead and became the first fruits of these people back here that slept. Christ is the first fruits of a resurrection that's going to happen at his coming. And so all these men back here that slept is going to be resurrected at his coming. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery. We, now notice Paul's not dealing with them. He's not dealing with they, he's now dealing with us. Paul's getting ready to show us a mystery now, meaning this, what Paul's about to show you was not prophesied. This is something that had been kept secret by God. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So what Paul's talking about here is a mystery event uh, called the rapture. And this is what's important to get, guys, is that the rapture is a strictly Pauline doctrine. It was a, it was a part of the mystery revealed to Paul. It is not a prophetic doctrine. 
the rapture was not prophesied. It was kept secret by God. And so Paul, when he's dealing back here, them that slept, this is dealing with prophecy and the resurrection of them that slept at the coming of Christ. But Paul's now showing us a mystery dealing with us. And so when you add the mystery here, you have them that slept, Christ the first fruits here at his resurrection. Then you have all the people saved during the church age. Everybody saved today during this time has become a part of the body of Christ. Uh, their, their calling and their blessings are up here in the heavenly places. And so we are all going to be changed at this event right here, not at his coming, but at the last trump. And it's dealing with this rapture. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall be shall be raised first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a mystery. And so all the people saved during this dispensation is going to be gathered out here at the rapture to meet the Lord in the air and taken up into the heavenly places. All them that slept from Adam to Christ are going to be risen up here at his coming. And so we are going to be raised and changed at the last trump. They are going to be raised at his coming. And you can read about that resurrection in Revelation chapter 20. Um, what 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 John calls the first resurrection, and it deals with the resurrection of them that slept, and then the rest of the dead are not going to live until after the thousand years. And so you have our rapture, then you have they that slept at his coming, they that are Christ at his coming, and then you have the rest of the dead being resurrected at the end of the millennial kingdom and judged before the great white throne. And so rightly dividing the resurrections, guys, you got, when you, when you study your Bible, you have to pay close attention to the details. When Paul says they, he's not talking about us. When he says we, he's talking about us. So when he says they that are Christ at his coming, He's not talking about you. He's talking about another group of people. When he says we shall all be changed at the last trump, now he's talking about us. And our rapture event is a mystery. This is why every person that tries to date the rapture or teach the rapture out of any other part of the Bible than the epistles of Paul don't know what they're doing because the rapture is a is a Pauline doctrine that was kept hid in God and revealed to Paul. You can't find it in Hebrews. You can't find it in Peter. You can't find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Isaiah, Psalms. It is only found in Paul's revelation. He said, I show you a mystery. If Paul is showing you a mystery, then that means you can't find it anywhere else other than where Paul revealed it. Um. So there's Revelation 20 and 5. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Then he says, this is the first resurrection. That resurrection there deals with they that are Christ at his coming. Um, real quick, guys. I've got a few minutes here. Now, this is important. Brother Bobby talks about this, and I, I ain't going to spend a lot of time here because I know he's been teaching on uh, uh, studying the Bible with respect to time. And time is a very important thing in the Bible. Uh, it is very important for us to rightly divide the Bible according to time. Um, for example, in Ephesians, you have time past, but now ages to come. Uh, you have last days, you have the times of refreshing, the times of restitution. Um, you have all these different times. John says, my brother, he says, little children, it is the last time. Peter says the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And so time, it's very important for us when we study the Bible to understand time. 
Now these these are some divisions. This this really takes you through the whole Bible. What I'm about to give you. Uh, Romans five thirteen through fourteen. You have a period called until the law, and it goes from Adam to Moses. Uh, Paul says that until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not puted where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So from Adam to Moses, there was no law. And so this is a period of time called until the law. Uh, then you have a period of time after that called the law and the prophets. It began with Moses and lasted all the way until John the Baptist. That's Matthew eleven thirteen. For the law and the prophets prophesied until John. And so you have until the law from Adam to Moses. And then you have the law and the prophets from Moses to John. John the Baptist marked the end of this time period called the law and the prophets. Uh, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, you have a period of time called the 70 weeks. Uh, called 70 weeks. They've been determined upon Israel and upon Jerusalem. and so. The time that you and I live in is not a part of the 70 weeks because God is not dealing. This time period was not determined upon Israel. Uh, this is a time of Gentile grace. And so this, this time period deals with the Gentile world. Uh, after this period, the 70 weeks of Daniel will resume. Um, Acts 1.22, you have from the baptism of Christ unto his ascension. Uh, Acts 2 1, you have from the Pentecost from the day of Pentecost to the fall of Israel. That is another time period that you got to rightly divide from our time period. Pentecost was not the beginning. Acts 2 was not the beginning of our dispensation. And so there's a time period there in the New Testament that goes from the baptism of Christ all the way to the fall of Israel. And that is specific to the nation of Israel, that time period. So Romans 11, 25, you have from the fall of Israel unto or until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That is our present dispensation. The time period that you and I live in goes from the fall of the nation of Israel to salvation being sent to the Gentiles. And this time period is going to last until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so beginning with the baptism of Christ all the way up to Acts chapter 7 is a time period there dealing with the nation of Israel. And then after their fall, God sent salvation to the Gentiles, and we've been living in that time period now for the last 2,000 years. And this, this present time is going to last until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Uh, after this time period, there's going to be a time period from Hebrews chapter four called today over there. He tells Israel today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And so there's going to, after, after our dispensation, God is going to begin speaking to the nation of Israel again. And he's going to begin preaching that gospel of the circumcision again. And he tells them there's a there's a certain period, there's a limited period of time there called today, and it's going to be followed by God's wrath and his rest. He says, if they he said, I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. And so, in order for them to, to enter into the rest of God, they have to hear his voice, unlike their fathers in the wilderness. If they don't hear God in that time period, they're going to be they're going to be destroyed by his wrath and not enter into his rest. This is going to happen during during the 70th week of Daniel. Then after the 70th week of Daniel, you're going to have the millennial kingdom, which lasts for a thousand years. And then you have the fullness of times. And I'm sorry, I can't go into greater detail on these things, guys, but I'm having to try to hurry up through this. Just. Go and study these things. Just read these things and study these things. Go read the scriptures I've got down here. And so that really, what I just gave you there, just in that brief timeline, believe it or not, takes you from Adam all the way to the end of, of time. Uh, that That is the whole Bible broken down into specific time periods. And there's more 
than this. This is very basic, but that is a that is a brief understanding of of how to rightly divide the Bible in accordance to time periods. Um, another thing is the different worlds in the Bible. You have multiple worlds, and when we talk about worlds, we're not talking about physical creation. We're talking about um, different systems or different what well, i don't even know how to explain it we're talking about more than just the physical creation we're talking about a a a system or operating power of the world or or the way the world operated uh, in second peter 3 6 you have the world that then was that was a pre-edemic world that was destroyed by god because of satanic rebellion that world perished then you have the old world that is the the, the world from adam to noah uh that second peter 2 5 it's called the world of the ungodly and how god brought in a flood to destroy that old world he spared not the old world um and so the world from adam to noah operated differently than our world uh, for example, there was no there was no human government in Adam's world. Uh, there was only the conscience of man. Uh, there was no uh, man had. God does not give man the power uh, to uh, incorporate corporate punishment. For example, when Cain killed Abel, God did not allow anybody to avenge the blood of Abel. After the flood, God tells man, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And so the world after Noah was different than the world before the flood. Uh, government was instituted and, and uh, promises were made to Abraham and things of that nature. And so the old world, God didn't spare it. He destroyed it uh, in the flood of the ungodly. Uh, Galatians 1 4, Paul talks about the present evil world. That's the world that you and I now live in. Uh, it lasts, it goes from the flood to the second coming of Christ. It's called the present evil world. Lasts roughly about three, 3,600 years, 4,000 years, however you want to look at it. Uh, Hebrews 2 5, the world to come. Uh, that is the world that's going to be established by Jesus Christ. That's going to be in subjection to Jesus Christ, completely different than the world that we now live in. It lasts for a thousand years. And then we have the world without end in Ephesians 3.21. That world takes place in the fullness of times. So you have the world that then was prior to Adam, the old world from Adam to Noah, present evil world from the flood to the second coming, the world to come is the thousand-year millennial kingdom of Christ, and then the world without end is in the new heaven and the new earth when we go out to the fullness of times and eternity. That world will have no end. It, it is completely subdued and subjected back to God, submitted to God, and delivered to God by Jesus Christ. So what Christ does for a thousand years is he reigns until he puts all enemies under his feet, that's for a thousand years and then he takes that kingdom and delivers it back to his father and then that's that goes out into the world without end um the comings of christ guys and then i'll be done here you got to rightly divide the, the 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 different comings of jesus christ um right here's his first coming uh, Paul says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. That is the first coming of Christ. Uh, what is the first coming of Christ for? He come to save sinners. Uh, the book of Hebrews tells us that he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the first coming of Christ, he came to save sinners. He came to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Right now, after he died on the cross, a lot of people miss this stuff right here. Uh, but after he died on the cross, when he rose from the dead, 
uh, he tells the, the, this woman here in John 20 and 17, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Notice he tells this woman not to touch him because he's not yet ascended. But later he appears to his disciples, Luke 24, 39, and says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Now notice he tells the woman, John 20, not to touch him, but later he tells his brethren to handle him. That means between John 20, between John 20 and this event in Luke 24, Christ ascended to his father. And so after his resurrection, he ascends to his father and then he comes back to the earth and appears to his disciples. And the reason that woman couldn't touch him is because he's got to ascend to God and, and, and present himself before God's throne as that great high priest. As the writer of Hebrews says that he didn't, he didn't enter into holy places made with hands, but he's entered into heaven itself, not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood. He hath entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And so Christ, after his death, he has to ascend to his father by his own blood, where he goes before the father and offers his blood as the atoning redemption for all time. And so by the time he comes back now, he says, now you can touch me, you can handle me. That blood has been applied. That blood has been presented before God the Father, and God is completely satisfied now with that blood. Uh, then later, so he came into the world, he died on a cross, he ascended to his Father, he came back to the earth, he showed himself for 40 days and 40 nights, he showed himself alive, and then in Acts 1-9, when he had spoken these things, while, I, while, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And so now they, this is his ascension back to God to, to set down at God's right hand until his enemies be made his footstool. But one of the things I want you to notice is in Acts 1 11, that they're told here, they're, they're rebuked. He said, because th these two men say, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That's the second coming. They're saying that Christ is going to return to the earth the same way you've seen him go away. And so they're, they're told not to stand there gazing up into heaven. You and I, Paul said, our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior. You see, you and I are to be looking for Christ to come and rapture us. These men were not to stand gazing into heaven. Why? Because they were told in Luke chapter 20, uh, Luke chapter 21, I believe it's verse 28, they're told when to look up. He said, when you see all these things, then lift up your heads. Look up into heaven for your redemption draweth nigh. That's the second coming. Before, before they are to lift up their heads and look for the Lord's return, there were other signs that had to take place first. There are no signs of our rapture. Nothing, there is, there's, we, we are to be looking for the Lord every day, guys. He could come right now and rapture us. He could come tomorrow. We are to always be looking for the return of our Lord to call us out. In the prophetic program, there are other signs that have to happen first. Christ tells them, when you see all these things, then lift your head up, then look into heaven, for your redemption draweth nigh. And so that's the difference between our rapture and the second coming. The second coming, you can't look for the second coming until other events happen first. Our rapture could happen at any moment. And therefore, we are not to be looking for signs. We are to be looking for the Lord. 
We're not to be looking for wars and rumors of wars and signs in the heavens and all these other things. We are looking for the Lord from heaven. That's what we're looking for. Uh, the rapture. This is uh, what we call 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. <laughs> I got a misspelling there. Um, that coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him is called the rapture. That is not the second coming. Uh, that coming of the Lord there is to gather his church unto himself. Paul wrote about it, 1 Thessalonians 4. That he's going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the angel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ are going to be raised and we which are alive remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so notice that we're being called up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. It's what Paul's talking about, 1 Thessalonians 2.19. Where he says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? <clears throat> and so what Paul's talking about there is, is the day that we are presented in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's, uh, Paul's whole labor, his whole ministry was to get these people ready to be to appear and be presented before the Lord Jesus Christ. That was going to be his joy and his rejoicing in that day is when those people were presented before the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's trying to get them ready for that appearing before Christ. So this is the rapture. Now in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, we read, uh, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father. Notice this now, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now back here, so back here, there's a coming of the Lord to gather us. And now right here, there's a coming of the Lord with all his saints. And so... What he's talking about here is he's talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice who it's before. Back here, we were in the presence. He's talking about our presence uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Right here, he's talking about us being before God the Father. Now, where's God the Father? He's in the third heaven. And so what Paul's talking about here is the coming of Jesus Christ with his church back to heaven before God the Father. And so he's going to come from heaven. He's going to gather us to himself. We're going to be presented before the judgment seat of Christ, before the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he is going, then, then he's going to go back to heaven with us and present us before God the Father. And so 1 Thessalonians 3.13 is talking about the coming of the Lord with his saints back to heaven. That's a very, I love that passage right there, guys. I, I try to picture that in my head, that he comes down, he gathers us, and then we all go back to heaven with him before God and the Father. That is going to be a great day of rejoicing when Christ comes with his church back to the third heaven before God the Father. It's going to be a, a triumphant day. And so that is a, just, just know and understand that every time you see the phrase coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not talking about the same event. Uh, then you have this coming right here, the second coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. At that coming, unto them that look for him shall he appear without sin unto salvation. At that coming right there, he's coming to save Israel and he's coming to execute, he's coming to judge and make war in the earth. The second coming, he's coming to judge and make war and to save his people Israel. And so the rapture, he's coming to gather his church. And then at the second coming, he's coming to judge and make war and save the nation of Israel. Uh, 